I'm not a public speaker. I don't play one on TV. I'm really not real good at it. But when I get to tell somebody about God or brag about God, it just seems to it just seems to happen and happen easily. But I also chase a lot of rabbits. So I made myself some notes because I'm on a schedule. And I was told I only have 45 minutes, is that what you said? An hour, okay, thanks. So, and, and when uh, the email started flying back and forth a little bit this week between Trey and I about um, this gratitude attitude. You know, this is, this is my favorite time of year. Thanksgiving is my favorite time of year. Um, I love everything about it. I really do, I love the, it's getting cooler, the leaves, it's hunting season. I don't know if we have any hunters here, but we come from a lot of hunting up around um, home. But that's, it's not a real um, thankful time or a gracious time for some. And my wife, Chrissy, if you haven't met her, this is my wife, Chrissy, down here. And I, I had it in my notes to introduce her before I started, and I didn't, so I'm sorry. <laughs> this is my wife, Chrissy. And um, she gets this um, a holy experience, which is a devotion from Ann Voskamp. I don't know if anybody here follows Ann Voskamp or not. But she was talking to me about this last week. And I thought I would read it because I thought it fell right in line with, with what you're doing down here during this Thanksgiving time. And it says, why November is statistically the hardest month and how to beat it. So according to the guys in lab coats with thick glasses, they say November is the month of the year that depression is most likely to set in. Most likely to spike and prick hard and deflate everything unexpectedly. About the middle of the month, they say, right before Thanksgiving. Clouds can hang low in November, the dark underbelly of things pressing too close. And the guys in the lab coats, they also say this, that if you write down five things a day that you're grateful for, your happiness set point rises like a flame in the dark. You feel 25% happier if you focus on the things that you're thankful for. It's like pushing back the dark. People who were in a gratitude condition felt fully 25% happier. They were more optimistic about their future. They felt better about their lives. They even did almost an hour and a half more of exercise a week. I was going to leave that part out because <laughs> I don't exercise very much. How we behold determines if we hold joy, behold glory, and be held by God. The strange, quiet paradox of this, our lives change when we receive life with thanks and ask for nothing to change. So let the rain fall in November, let the clouds scuttle west, let the kettles whistle of better things, and let us raise up in thanks. And that's what, that's what I think is what you've been talking about down here, of, of to count your blessings and to, and to say thanks about that. I am privileged at home. I, I have a son who's 18 years old. His name's Bo. And for the last four years, he and seven of his um, accountability partners, which are really his best friends, have met every Sunday night and committed to me and before God that they would meet every Sunday night all the way through high school and hold each other accountable. We'd do a Bible study. We'd do a small group devotion. Sometimes we'd just get together and talk about the problems, what the challenges are. And I presented this to 18-year-old boys last Sunday. And it was interesting because we were going to go around the room and just, what are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? We were going to come up with five things, but just one at a time. The first three, Taco Bell, donuts, and sleep. <laughs> but it got a little deeper than that. We wound up talking about their friends, the friends that were in that group. We wound up talking about their family, their mom and dad, their aunts and uncles, their grandparents. And number one, we all landed on the Lord and how thankful we were. And at the end of what took an hour and a half to, to go around the room, the happiness in that room, it was amazing. I think it was more than 25%. There was no more complaining about the game. There was no more complaining about the coach. Should have played me, but they didn't. There was no more complaints. It was, we were in an attitude of gratitude. And it worked. And if it can work with 18-year-old boys, I think it can work with about anybody. But that was... That was a real positive experience for me and for those kids. And what it reminded me of, um, I will talk about Africa a little bit, but I know that you guys have heard a lot about it, and, and so I wasn't going to just pound Africa home tonight. But I wanted to tell you a little story um, about Africa and how it, it affected my life. Um, my first trip to Africa came after my wife and daughter went on a trip. 
and came home and told me about it. I couldn't go. I was working in another ministry at the time, and I just couldn't get away. But after they came home and told me about it, and Ian and Janine Maxwell, you've heard their names, they were coming through Cape and uh, called and wanted to have breakfast with Christy and I and just, just hang out and talk. And we talked about things, what, Jimmy, what you're doing, what we're doing. We, we, we realized that what I was doing in a ministry called Men at the Cross, focusing on men's discipleship, the Second Timothy 2-2 model of Paul and Timothy and one guy sharpening another and then sending him out so he can go sharpen another. Janine looked at me and she goes, that's, that's the same problem we're having in Swaziland. It's the lack of male Christian leadership. You need to bring that message to Swaziland. And I want you to come for six weeks. Well, Janine, I got a job back here, and this is what we're doing. And I, I called the guy that I work with, worked with in Men at the Cross, and I said, man, I've, I've been invited to Swaziland to bring the Men at the Cross message. Pretty cool. And he said, I'm not going international, Jimmy, but you go. And we looked at the calendar, and there was a six-week window where we didn't have an event, just a lot of planning, a lot of logistics that I could do from overseas. So I went to Swaziland for six weeks and shared the Men at the Cross message shared discipleship, met with all of our pastors that we're partnered with over there. And after that six weeks, you know, I saw all you see in Swaziland. You've heard about it. You've heard about all the kids. You'll see some pictures later. Um, the HIV and the AIDS and the tuberculosis and just all the negative, negative, negative stuff that's going on there. I got on the plane to come home after being there six weeks. And at that point, I was based on everything I had witnessed, based on Christy coming home and my daughter coming home and telling me about how bad things were, I was prepared. I was going to get on this plane and the guilt was going to get to me about where I'm going home, what I'm going home to, where I'm going home to, who I'm going home to, my church, my hospital, my grocery store, my house, my cars, my, my stuff. I was ready. Here comes the guilt. So I get on the 16-hour flight and we take off and I'm like, all right, God, just give it to me. Just give it to me. I know this is going to hurt. Nothing, nothing. So we get about halfway into the flight, and I'm not watching a movie. I'm, not, I'm just sitting there kind of braced for this hammer that's going to come. Eight hours into the flight, nothing. We land in Atlanta. God had been silent. We land in Atlanta. I'm like, okay, it's going to happen. When we, when we touch, down, touch down, that's what's going to happen. And that is when it happened. We touch down in Atlanta, and I didn't audibly hear God's voice never have other than through the voice of some children and the voice of you know worship and stuff like that but I sure did hear it in my heart and he said how dare you Jimmy Wilker feel guilty about what I chose for you I chose all these things I chose I chose your skin color I chose your home I chose where you were going to live in Cape Girardeau I chose your wife I chose your past I chose your parents I chose the love that's around you I chose all of that so how dare can you feel guilty about all these things. You're grateful for all these things. You've told me. Thank you, God, for all these things. How could you feel guilty about that? So I'm kind of speechless. I'm like, the hammer didn't come, or I didn't think it had, until then he asked me the question that followed that. What are you doing with all the things that I've given you? You've told me your whole life for 44 years how grateful you are for all these things, for where you are, for who you are, for all, this, all these blessings in your life. I chose all of those for you. What are you doing with them? That one, that one hurt. That stung a little bit. Because I think, oh, well, I know. I've, I've, I've kept some of those close to me instead of sharing those. And that was, a, that was a pivotal moment for me. And our the scriptures that were read earlier, Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, and, and James 1, 27, that's what we base for Africa on. And as I, as I read through those, Ephesians 5.15, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. If I know what I know, and God has spoken to me the way he did, I've, I have wisdom now. So if I'm not using that wisdom, I'm disobedient. Making the most of every opportunity. Every op I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss an opportunity to use what he's given me. I don't want to miss it. Because the days are evil, they're numbered, they're short. We only have so many, so many days. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Stop. The will of God. Has anybody ever prayed, God, just show me your will? I just, I want to be in your will. I just, I want to. One honest person in the crowd. <laughs> Two honest people. I used to pray it all the time. God, just, 
reveal your will to me. I want to be in the middle of your will. And in his still, quiet voice, he would always say, just read my word. It's, it's not difficult, James. Just read my word. Which took me to James 1.27. Religion that God our Father, by the way, I, I hate the word religion. Because of what we've done to that word. Religion has been, it's been abused. I love the way God defines religion. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from, pe- from being polluted by the world. After these two verses, which are the foundation for Heart for Africa, I started praying for opportunities to use what God's given me and to recognize those opportunities because I think they've been there. A lot of times they've been there. We've all missed opportunities in our lives. But I, I, I started to pray that, God, let me, let me not run past something. Let me recognize an opportunity. And not too long ago, um, I was just in Swaziland last month. And um, three months before that, I met a young lady there. Um, his name is Hadile. I've got to get the clicks down here because they, they have clicks in Swaziland. Hadile. And Hadile was eight and a half months pregnant, had two children, 17 years old. She didn't want this child. I don't need another mouth to feed. I'm going to abandon this child. And you've heard about our baby home, and you've heard about the abandoned babies, and you've heard about all of that stuff. So we said, well, if you will do this, if you will eat this food, if you will help us take care of that child for the next two weeks, we'll take that child. If you're going to give that child up, we'll take that child. And that child now lives at El Rohi Baby Home. So that was, my, that was the day I landed in Swaziland this past summer. I go back... Um, four months later, with a group of guys, we're going to do a construction trip on Project Canaan. And we had been there the whole week, and we were focused on Project Canaan, and I was praying for an opportunity. Because if all you get to do is go and work on Project Canaan, you kind of miss what's going on out in, the, out in the rural community. And I was praying for an opportunity for us to, God, get us in the game. These guys, they love what's going on at Project Canaan. We're playing with babies, and we're wrestling with them, and then we're nailing nails and building buildings and all that kind of stuff that guys do. The last day we were there, we were leaving the next morning early. Janine gets a call, and this lady, Kabile, um, is in trouble. What we didn't know about her was in her small little community, she was, um, she was the tool. She was the sex slave. Her kids were. And there was support coming in for her in the form of food, in the form of some clothes. And her community was taking all of that from her. And um, she was scared to death. And she called Janine and she said, I've run away. I've got my kids. I can't go back home. Can I I get some help? Well, Janine calls me and she says, I'm so glad you have your um, 10 guys here because we need to go do a rescue. And we hadn't done this yet. We were more about the babies and they're abandoned and there's nobody there who's wanting to fight you when you go get them. But this community was going to fight for her. So we went and picked her up and we went to her home to get what few possessions that she had. And $20 would have covered it all. And looking back, I kind of wish we would have just given her a $20 bill and said, let's just leave that there. But we went back because this is all she had. And it was pouring down rain, and we're in a couple vehicles, and it's muddy, and it's nasty, and we pull up. Nobody's there, and she unlocks her her little hut door, and we go in, and we start making a few trips out with some of the the things. It's old clothes. It's an old broken-down table, just some stuff. And she goes, I think she knew what was getting ready to happen. She got her two kids, and she went and got in the back of the van, stayed there. And I had my pastor with me, and, and Mark went and stayed with her as well. And that's when people started to come. And that's when things got really tense really fast. A lot of screaming, a lot of hollering, a lot of pushing and pulling and tugging on me and my team that was there. Janine, she's stuck in the mud. She can't get out. She's, she doesn't panic over much. This woman's got a pretty solid resolve, but she was very nervous. Janine, we got to get out. We got to get out. We got to get out. And this, this went on, went on. I'm like, guys, we've got to finish, finish up the stuff. Everybody just stay cool and collect. So 
stay cool and pray. They're not going to be cool, and that's okay. Just stay cool and pray. We'll get out of here. They hadn't recognized what was going on yet, but it became crystal clear in just a little bit. So we, they start bringing cinder blocks in and throwing cinder blocks and building barricades where we can't get out of the alley and, and getting physical with us. And I wind up get everybody back in the van, and I push my way to the door, and Janine, we've got her headed down the alley, so she's headed out, and um, all of a sudden, one of the guys in the van yells, duck, they're picking up rocks. And by this time, there was probably 50 people there, all very upset that we were taking Cabilo out of their, out of their community. They're picking up rocks, duck. Oh, I couldn't duck, because I was driving. Everybody else in the van, you know, it's just glass windows all the way around the van. And everybody ducked. And I wanted to see where the rocks were coming from so I could duck, you know, so I could dodge them while I'm driving out. And I look over as, as they're picking up the rocks, and they're reared back, and they're like this. They couldn't release them. And that's when it dawned on me what I was in the middle of. I was in the middle of a spiritual battle manifesting itself physically. There was definite evil. There was definite good. And God said, I got it. I needed you guys to do this today, but I got this. And they could not release those rocks. And we drove away as they're running down the alley after us, but none of them could release the rocks. They're like they were, they were frozen in their hands. And the guys raised up, and all the guys saw what was happening. The girls saw what was happening. And, uh, and everybody just started just praising God. It was, it was an amazing moment. I prayed for an opportunity, and God gave me an opportunity. And, um, and, I, and I, I recognized it. I recognized it after the fact. Had I recognized it, you know, when they first started hollering at us and screaming at us, I probably would have been a little more <laughs> uncomfortable because it was a pretty uncomfortable situation. But um, I encourage you guys to make yourself available. We had a guy on the trip. His name was Michael. His name is Michael. And for three years, he had been telling me, Jimmy, I want to go to Africa with you. I want to go to Africa with you for three years. And it's an expensive trip. You know, it's a, it's a $4,000, $4,500 trip. It's not cheap. But if you want to go, surely over the course of three years, you can beg, borrow, or steal $4,000 from your friends or from your church or from the offering or wherever you're going to get it. And I looked at him. Um, this, was, this was two weeks before the trip went. We were at a global leadership conference. And he puts his arm around me, old buddy, and, and I said, you know, Michael, I don't think you want to go. I really don't think you want to go. You've had three years. I'm leaving in, I'm leaving in two weeks. Now you're, now you're going to talk about, what, I wish I could go on this trip. You've had three years. Don't give it up. You don't really want to go. And he said, well, I've, I've prayed about it, and, and the money just hasn't, hasn't come. And I said, well, have you told God yet? I said, we serve such an amazing God. And I've only found one thing that, that, that God won't do for me. He won't say yes for me. That's, that's me. That's, that's my responsibility. And I said, Michael, I don't believe you've said yes. I don't believe you're man enough to stand here and tell me you've said yes. And I was being a little bold with him because he's been feeding me this for three years. And I was kind of just like, it's time to either go or go. And he kind of looked at me like, God, that was kind of rude, Jimmy. I, I guess I'll go play over here for a while. We went into a, a session at the Global Leadership Summit and came out two hours later, and I see him out in the hallway, and I'm thinking, man, there, there was my friend Michael. He used to be, used to be good buddies. He comes up, and he's crying, and he's, you know, God, you know, he's all weepy, and he's having, you know, I got a baby, and, and he said yes. So he just came up to me, and he said yes. And I said, are you telling me yes? Are you telling him yes? He's just crying. And I get a little choked up talking about it because I can see him. He's a little distant. I said, Jimmy, I don't know how that's going to happen. But yes. It was a two-day conference. That was the end of, end of the first day. And I went home. Christy and I were talking about it. Now, this is pretty cool. How can, how can we help get Michael there? Um, you know, how can we raise $4,000 in, in two weeks? The end of the second day, we go back to the conference the next day. I don't see him. Christy and I are walking out of the conference. The next day, Jimmy, Jimmy, Chrissy. Turn around, it's Michael and his wife. He 
said, all I, I, all I did was tell people that I had said yes. And they said it paid for it. I got all the money in 24 hours. He said, you were so right. All I had to do was tell God yes. Just be obedient. And he got it. And Micah went on this trip, and he just cried like a baby the whole time. He was almost embarrassing. But <laughs> going to the children's home and playing with the kids, I mean, and he's, he's a construction guy. He's just like a stud. He's just crying all the time. I'm like, Micah, please shut me up. And he was just like, Jimmy, this is just the most amazing thing. I can't believe I haven't said yes in so many months. And he said, I've just given God the carte blanche on yes. You have me for the rest of my life. Just lead me where you want me to go. Um, I'm going to show you, we have a a slide. um, And I just wanted to share a few stories about kind of the residual from Heart for Africa. But we put a little slideshow together that we'll run now and and, um, and just give you kind of an overview of what we're doing on the farm, what's going on there. And um, is there going to be music to that? There is going to be music to that. Fantastic. And then I'll close after that. that God's having in Tulagi now. And I just want to leave, um, leave you with a little bit of a challenge, something to think about. Um, what are you thankful for? Take the time. Take the time to say it. Take the time to tell your spouse, tell your brother, tell your sister, tell your mom what you're thankful for. And then what are you doing with that God's given you? That's the challenge. This is a giving church. We're an Acts 1-8 church. You guys are doing that. But don't take for granted where you are and what you have and why God gave that to you. Thank you.
for allowing Christian and me to come. Thank you for being who you are. Do we have a moving minister? This is where we're going. <laughs> God bless you all. Thank you. Oh, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. So we'll clap for God after I pray. Father, we just we love you so much, God, and I just I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the, who you are, who we are in you, all that we are in you here on earth. Father, thank you for an, an opportunity, another opportunity just to, to brag on you. Um, it's so easy to do. God, I pray, um, pray blessings over Harper Africa, over the continuation of what you started. I pray blessings over this church and these people who look a whole lot like you, who sound a whole lot like you. Father, and Christian and I are so blessed that you've just, you, you've opened up doors to, to more things and to more people who we want to associate with. God, we love you so much. We thank you for uh, the, the, the gift that we have, the promise that we have, the hope that we have. And Father, instill in us the desire, the deep desire to use everything that you've given us not to waste a minute, not to waste an opportunity, not to waste a blessing, not to waste it, but to put it to use. The days have numbers. They are numbered. So, Father, just prick our hearts. Continue to call us into the field to represent you and to love those who need to hear it. Amen. Now we can clap for God.